Okay, so I'm Andrew Rubinger from JMOS Middleware. I'm here back uh, with Adam Koblenz at Zero Turnaround. Today, uh, we're here at the Java Meetup, and we've been talking uh, about a bunch of tools that we can use to make development of enterprise Java uh, hopefully a lot easier and faster. We've gone over the GeekSeek examples from the book Continuous Enterprise Development in Java by O'Reilly, uh, written by uh, me and my buddy Ashlak Knutson in Oslo. Um, so I think today we're going to go and uh, now take a look at the example application and, and see what that's all about. Uh, for here we have uh, a fresh instance of JBoss EAP6. Uh, so what we're going to do is just kind of fire this up, up in its full mode and uh, deploy the application. Um, the full application is available uh, right here. Um, and this projector is a little bit dimmer. Yeah, this one's a little bit dimmer. Yeah, still see me all right? Not so much. Okay. So uh, here we have uh, the GeekSeek application. Um, as we said, this is kind of like a very slimmed down clone of Lanyard, but uh, it does a couple neat things like um, we log in uh, via Twitter credentials. So what I'm going to do here is I'll say log in and then it uses OAuth and it pops up this little like, hey, do you want to let this application? Log in as you, and yeah, now you guys can all see my username and password as I sign in to Twitter, which will then send a token back to the GeekSeek application and say, hey, cool. So if you want to know how to do uh, OAuth with Twitter, we have one way as an example in the book, and here we are. And what we can do is we can go through and do things like add conferences. Like, for instance, today we're here at the Boston Java <coughs> Meetup. We're meeting up in 90 degrees. <laughs> it's warm. Uh, this will have a start date uh, today, like this time. Uh, and we're going to end, I don't know, let's say we'll just stay here in the heat until sometime in the middle of October. We'll add the conference, and there we are. We've added a conference, OK? So uh, we're not going to go through the whole app, but this is basically the application that we've gone through in the book and all the use cases that are in there in some way tie back to this thing, which again, you can like download and run and actually get into and click around and see how things work. Our user interface tests work on this. Our RESTful tests, which test the HTTP endpoints that are built in a, in a RESTful KDOS fashion, um, are, are in there. Uh, the example we saw earlier today about the sending of the email, that's tested in here. Um, so what we're going to do, now that we've like tested this application, I think it's pretty cool for us to go and actually uh, take a look at what it's what this application is doing. And Zero Turnaround um, has has released this new product called XRebel, uh, which Adam will, will come up to explain for us. And XRebel is ultra cool um, because it's going to it acts as a job agent. So uh, you're giving it all sorts of ghostly powers by nature of um, registering this job agent at, at runtime, right? But when I click in here. Now that I've booted this up with XRebel, you see that I have this neat little widget down at the bottom. And when I click on this guy, it gives me some context uh, regarding SQL queries, uh, stuff that's in the session, um, exceptions that were thrown, and then there's like some settings and stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'll configure this to filter out, um, or we'll see the whole thing first. First, I'll log in again. And because I've already authorized myself, it now clicks in. And here I am, and I'm authorized, and I'm in. Um, and it shows me that I've now executed seven SQL queries. Um, and it's showing me like the full boat of stuff that's actually going through in the runtime. So we'll go through and we'll configure. Can I make it a little bigger? Yeah, I can make it bigger. Um, how can I make it bigger? Shift command plus. What is it? Shift command plus. Shift command plus. How's that? A little better? Cool. Um, this particular package is under org. Continuous Enterprise Development in Java. So I'm just going to save that. And now when I go and I, I clear through now, we see that um, my call to stack is kind of limited to the stuff that I've set in my filter. So I'm only seeing my stuff. Um, and we'll see here that like through the register user uh, call and the OAuth authenticator, eventually we get this insert into user and we have a select into user. We see all the calls and the uh, like queries that were executed. And um, the uh, the URLs that were that were part of executing that whole 
calls back too. We also have a bunch of stuff. These are all the stuff that's in the session data. So at runtime, you can kind of see what's in there. Um, probably a little bit more appropriate for me to introduce and for me to call up Adam to come and tell us about X Rebel and uh, give us a little bit of a tour. So we can a warm welcome for our buddies. Thank you. Hey everybody. Um, so my name is Adam Kobuns. I'm the product marketing manager uh, at Zero Turnaround. Um, so this is actually my second time being at the Boston Java Meetup in a speaking fashion. Uh, previously, I came here with our CEO, uh, Yevgeny Kavanov, uh, talking about uh, our continuous delivery tool. So one of the things I kind of want to talk about is, you know, we're talking about enterprise Java today, talking about Java EE and how hard it is to test it. So one of the things that I did uh, before I joined Zero Turnaround was I actually worked as a back-end framework developer for a large investment bank. And that meant writing lots and lots of Java EE that was incredibly legacy, um, and all, all the hassles that involved in that that the, you know you guys lived through, that Andrew lived through. He you know actually took, took the initiative to to write his own framework to deal with the testing. I just quit and did something else. Uh, so uh, one thing that I were having to do explicitly that I wish I had uh, Artillion for was I had to, basically I had to write a framework on top of Spring that was also interchangeable with Java EE so that people could write their code using either of them um, interchangeably with my framework, uh, whatever, whatever kind of components they wanted to use. And that means that I had to support uh, even the incredibly esoteric uh, app server specific stuff that only WebSphere and WebLogic supported and half of it was written on Spring. So that means that I had to be able to write test cases that would work with message-driven beans uh, and also write stuff that normal Spring Pojos would deal with. So my life was terrible for a long time dealing with this stuff, right? Um, couple that with the fact that my test suite took six days to run uh, because it had 35 components, and each component, because basically I had to have at least one component for every component of Spring, plus extras that handled the extra Java EE stuff. So if I wanted to do a full release of my software, it took me over a day to actually even put a new zip file of jars onto my own website internally. Uh, so uh, this kind of led me to go into some conferences, trying to like learn how to optimize things, figure out what I could do, because I was dealing with 15-year-old with Java at this point, right? This was, as soon as Java existed, as soon as like, Oak became Java, people started actually using this in the real world. Um, the bank that I worked at actually started using it for their own stuff too. And they basically started migrating the C and C++ frameworks into Java, just straight porting them with the same APIs and everything along the way. And that led to this amalgamation of nonsense that I had to work on day in and day out. Um, so at a conference, I met Evgeny, who's our, the CEO and founder of Zero Turnaround. Um, and I learned about JREBEL. And this, what, what I learned in this made me realize that like, I had possibly the worst Java enterprise job that one could have from a build and productivity standpoint. <laughs> so um, this, is, this, is, this is funny now, right? Now that I don't do this anymore. But um, if we think about what my life was like, uh, you should all feel bad for me uh, and pity me. And I want your, your blessings. Uh, but basically, um, what happened was I was given the opportunity to join Zero Turnaround. And I've never been happier, right? Because I now have the opportunity to solve the problems that I had for you guys and make your lives way better without you know you having to do a whole lot, right? I'm not asking you to change frameworks. I'm not asking you to change apps. I'm not asking you to change tech stacks or culture in your company. Um, I'm asking you just to add a Java agent to your JVM options. Um, I think that's pretty reasonable. Uh, so basically. What I'm here to talk about today is I have I have two things. I have, let's see how this works with this crazy resolution. I should try playing this. All right, so here's me. This is actually a picture that one of my friends, uh, one of my friends who's an amazing photographer, only takes pictures of me when we're at bars. I don't know why. So every picture of me on Facebook or other I have from conferences are all like iPhone quality camera pictures, so they're all terrible. But he brings out his ten thousand dollar set of lenses and like and, and SLRs and stuff to bars. So every good picture of me is me with a drink in my hand. So that's this is the one that I'm just going to stick with for a while because it looks interesting. So this was a taken at the at Cafe Luna, I believe it's called in Salem. It's like the the Czech bar in Salem. It's a cool place. 
Um, I used to be a software engineer. I was a you know, senior software engineer at a bank. Uh, I left the bank to go work at Zero Turnaround. I started the pre-sales team there, trained up all the other pre-sales engineers, developed all the demos and all that kind of stuff. And now I'm in marketing because I realized how much I hated marketing. And I wanted to fix that by making good marketing that people actually want to look at because we have good stuff that's worth talking about. So what Zero Turnaround does is we basically provide revolutionary tools to help you develop higher quality software faster. And what it gives us our JR Bolt, which is, which is our seven year old product, seven years old as of last week actually. That's the anniversary of uh, the first version, which had a different name, different code base, completely different functionality, features, and everything. Um, so it's seven years old. And XRebel, which is, I think, two and a half months old now. Uh, so this is the first time anyone is speaking in public about XRebel that is not in Estonia, which is, where, which is where our companies are based. So, so far, we've only had one webinar thing about this, where we actually have our own conference in Estonia, and Evgeny gave a talk about this. So this is the first time anyone's ever, like, I'm, this is the first recording of anyone talking about this in the US. Um, and it's awesome, because we actually have seen so much adoption with Actrable. People like people want to use that and trade in licenses for Jamable, because it's so cool. Um, so the point of Actrable is we want to commit better code. And I'll kind of talk more about what, what that really means. But Jarable changed code instantly. We have support for all the major IDEs, all the major app servers, and that includes the entire JLaw suite, so AS, Wildfly, and EAP. Well, and we support really old versions of things all the way to the latest ones. Um, so if you're on like the bleeding edge of Tommy, for example, we support it. That's not a problem. Frameworks, we have support for over 85 frameworks. So that means that you can not only make code changes to your normal Java code, but also your framework integrations. So if, say you want to change your Spring config, that's not a problem for us. Make the change, hit refresh in your browser, and you'll see the code change. And I'll show you this working, too. Um, we've been issued for over 85. Xrebel is X-ray glasses for your web app. What that means is that it gives you the ability from the most junior developer to the most senior JVM tuning architect guy, right, to understand the performance of your application, improve the quality of your application, and reduce rework. Because the amount of times, the number, the number of times I and other people I know have written code that passed all our tests, went to QA, QA signed off on it, goes to production, and you find there's some performance bug that only shows up under like intense load, or you find that there's some latency issue that only shows on a database, right? That's actually not part of your machine or not part of your own, your, your data center, right? Then it comes back to you and you're like, crap, what are we gonna do with this, right? So then, you're, then you know, your company's paying for that rework, you're spending your time reworking on something that you already thought was done, and so you wanna help reduce that. So with x trouble, you can find and fix session bloat. So whether you have incredibly fast, uh, gr fast growing deltas in your session, or you have m memory leaks in your session, we can find that. Rogue SQL, like you have incredibly uh, inefficient queries, like you have N plus one queries, or you have um, inefficient uh, ORM configurations, like you have your, your hibernates configured poorly, that kind of stuff. Um, and also hidden exceptions. So every single enterprise application I've ever seen, there are exceptions and everyone just says, oh, we know why those happen, so we're gonna ignore those now. Until you don't know why that happened, you think you did, and then you corrupted your production database. Um, we actually just published some case studies today where that actually was the case. One of our customers who's a Fortune 500 co company, um, they only have like 10 job devs in the whole company. They had these legacy applications, and they said, you know, we have these exemptions, we know why they happen, why aren't they worried about it? So then they launched Actrap, and within a week, they figured out that those exceptions were actually because of a critical misunderstanding and miscommunication between the API they and a business partner were using and what the collisions meant when they both had different diff differing data and how to merge it. And what we actually saved them from with Xrebel was we saved them from having their production and their and, and their vendors' production with different data sets for the products, basically. Um, and it would have been a huge problem on their end if this had actually gone live and actually been triggered. Because if say say if someone on the vendor side had changed the product, if they hadn't changed on their end, they wouldn't have had a proper merge. We would have just broken everything. They would have gotten screwed up with databases. Um, so this is the kind of thing, like, I know I'm guilty of this too. Like the apps I wrote in production definitely have exceptions. I think I know why they happen. 
But the guy who knows why they really happened quit five years ago or somewhere else in the company, it's not his job anymore, that kind of stuff, right? So now I want to give you a quick demo of these things. I'm using um, the Spring Pack Planet app for this. And the reason I'm using the Spring Pack Planet app instead of like a full like Java EE app is because I'm using the most commonly followed application in the world when it comes to how to do things, right? This is Spring's example of how to write Spring apps. If their own example is this screwed up, how great can everyone else's code be, <laughs> right? So I'm just going to close this, and I'm going to stop this because I want to actually launch this differently. So this is just me using Eclipse, and this is running my Tom, I'm running a local Tomcat, um, and I'm going to run this with my special extra local Tomcat. It's going to start up. I'm going to hit refresh, and we're going to see what I can do with this, right? So first off, um, with Jarable enabled, I can make code changes. So I can actually use actual to find my find the problems in my code, and then you can use Jarable to fix them without having to actually do a, a build and re refresh re recompile cycle. So hit refresh. Okay, my app's up and running. I have actual right here. It's letting me know that that it's up. Okay, so let's just say I want to start by making a really simple code change. Okay, so I'll go back to my Eclipse. And I'm just going to change this uh, this first page. So here, this is just a JSP change, right? I'll change some text. You know, we, we can all make JSP changes anyways, usually. Change a property file. Hit save. Now, go back to my browser. Hit refresh. We see that we have our, our, our changes, right? So the JSP code change worked. Uh, what we actually did is we don't move the files on the disk. We actually remapped the app server to look for your source tree. So all your static content gets pulled directly out of your source tree from now on. Instead of having to copy files on disk and deal with uh, overwriting the files inside of the, the deployment directory, <coughs> then we see that the messages.properties is getting reread, and we actually pick that up. And if you look inside the console, we see that the messages.properties got reloaded by Jarable. It's kind of hard to see probably because it's so small con it's console text, but we reload the bundled file inside of the WAR file without having to rebuild anything or move on on, on the uh, on the app server. Now, those are both simple, but Let's talk about doing a pretty common everyday, you know, Java dev change, right? So we're gonna do some form validation work, okay? So personally, on one of the apps I had to deal with, whenever I had to deal with form validation, I still had to build the whole app because we had a validation component that had to get injected into the application and it was, you know, a really complicated enterprise thing, right? So here I hit submit, all these fields are required. Okay, that's not a problem. I'll go back to my Eclipse. I go to the validator that we're using for this form. Yeah, I'm gonna try to do that. Good idea. Type pause. Got it. That's a lot. Is it? I thought it was text. Okay. So in this validator, we see that we have a bunch of string utils and it's going to um, reject the value if it doesn't exist or whatever, right? So I'm going to take this first name check. I'm just going to comment it out, okay? So now this is a method body change, right? This is the kind of change that if you have a debugger hooked up and your ID is set up correctly with your JVM and your app server, you can make this kind of change, okay? So I'll show you that. Sure, that's fine. Yep. I'm going to resubmit the form. Okay, that's fine, okay? But we actually didn't leverage that. We actually reloaded the class ourselves, right? And the reason that we did that is because we actually are so much better than, than JVM Hotswap that we don't want to risk Hotswap being involved in screwing up any of our stuff. So what we're gonna do now is much more complicated. I'm gonna actually refactor the class and create a new method by uh, cleaning up our code a little bit and restructuring it. So let's say, for example, I had a code review and my boss told me, look, Adam, I love that this works, but I hate that you have one giant method, and that one method is controlling the entire validation for your form. How about we clean this up a little bit? Maybe you want to reuse parts of this or parts of the validator somewhere else. Okay? So that's fine. We're gonna take the last name, address, and city checks, and we're just gonna refactor them into a new method. Okay? So I'm gonna create a new field method. Wow. Wow, that was bad. Okay. Um, so now I have a method call where they used to be. 
Now we actually change the schema of the class. So here's that at the end of that method. And here's our, our new method, okay? So we change the schema. And now just to prove that we're actually calling this new method, I'm actually gonna change some of the more of that, some of the other validation rules. So let's look at the last name optional, okay? And just for fun, let's do more than one change at a time, because that's not a problem for us. We're gonna to to make last name use a new key. Go to message.properties, add our new key at the end. Okay, hit refresh, sure. Okay, and so we see that just hitting refresh, we have the last names there, right? It's an optional, so the new method is being called. We also can see that the property, the property file got changed again, and we have our new key for the address. So we were able to basically redefine the schema for the class in the JVM, without having to do a redeploy or a restart, or even like a full build or anything. And if we look at what happened to the console, it's a little hard because it's a little too big, but we see that the class got reloaded for the, for the validator, but that's not it. We actually know what's going on inside the JVM because you know we have access to the whole object dependency graph. We also have access to the classes on disk, and we can see what's running in the JVM. So we can tell what frameworks you're using without any configuration. And we can also tell what else has to be reloaded based on your changes. So here, the validator got reloaded. Then also the add owner form and edit owner form both have references to the validator, so they both got reloaded too. And also the framework integration kicks in. You see that we actually start reconfiguring some beans. Because we can figure out that we're using Spring without you telling us anything. Like we can tell org.springframework.whatever is loaded in the JVM. Okay, let's check there. Okay, yes, there are beans defined for these things. Now we're gonna look at the code changes. Okay, let's wire them so that the new, new versions are actually the ones that are being used. And then at the end, just for fun, property file gets picked up again for that new key for the address. Okay, so this is really cool. And this allows you to basically, what we find is that this actually allows people to save about one full work month per year. So we do this huge study um, where we have like two to 3,000 people respond to our surveys every year. And we ask, what app server do you use? What frameworks do you use? How long does it take you to do a full build and compile the time of your application? How long does it take you to actually do a deploy? How long, and how many times do you actually make changes every hour that you want to deploy, right? And what we find is that people are so afraid of doing redeploys that they actually just bundle their changes and just kind of hope that they can isolate out what went wrong um, after they make their changes. Uh, and that's terrible, right? And we also have other people who really adhere to making one change at a time but they end up wasting half their time just kind of sitting there waiting for stuff to happen. I know that I personally spent a lot of time going to Starbucks across the street from my office. Um, I also spent a lot of time talking to my friends who worked elsewhere in the building. Uh, because I had, I had the 16, actually a 16 minute redeploy on one of the things I wrote. So um, the time it took me to say, hit save in my, in my IDE, do the ant build, which is like 20,000 lines of ant, and then come back and have a deployable WAR file, took me about 16 minutes. And then actually restarting my app server and reinitializing the application took like five minutes minimum because I actually was doing some uh, I was doing some uh, math on a database uh, and so I actually had to do to create a tree you know like a, a trie tree where I actually had to do mathematical probability and stuff on on a, on a set of data so I really wasted about 21 minutes of my life every time I made a code change that I can't get back right and as I got yeah sure. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so we actually disable auto-publishing and instead remap it to pull it out of your, out of your source code. So whether you're doing JavaScript, HTML, CSS, your pictures or whatever, you can avoid publishing. And the coolest thing is this actually works on remote JVMs too. So let's say for example you have, you know, let's say for example you're given a really weak laptop, but the company makes up for giving you a nice VM slice somewhere that's really powerful. We actually avoid you having to do the full transfer of the year or war and then publish it again. Because we actually use the browser, uh, sorry, we use the IDE to piggyback on the server context and actually send the files over HTTP to the server and then have it do the hot patching locally from that server. Um, and we have integration written for some uh, some cloud providers. We're working on, on OpenShift integration so you can get um, JBlock and cloud, yeah. Does the software then take over the process? Yeah, so you just, you, yeah, you just copy the jar file, add the Java agent, and that's it. And then the rest of the configuration is just installing the plugin into your IDE, 
and giving it the, uh, the full, the fully qualified context path for your app. Uh, and then we send the files over. Um, now what I want to show you is uh, how this works with XREPL. So this is, that was Jarable, right? That's our, our hot patching thing, which makes you more productive and less stressed out and overall happier as, as a coder. Um, now, Xrebel is what kind of helps you identify what's wrong with your code when it's the easiest and cheapest to fix, right? Because telling you that the code that you wrote a second ago is, is inefficient is way better than telling you the code you wrote six months ago crashed in production, right? Um, and what we want to kind of do is make it so that everyone can basically have, have a profiler, right? Like you want to think about like a profiler for the masses kind of thing, right? We don't want you to have to study to become like that JVM tuning expert to find what should be relatively easy things to figure out as long as your code. Um, now, before I get too far in this, I want to give you a, little, a couple of anecdotes and then I'll, then I'll show you what I'm talking about. So like we did extensive, uh, extensive testing uh, and, and customer interviews during the beta process with XRevel. And one of the things that we did was we would go actually to people's offices, install XRevel on their apps and say, hey, before we do anything, how, how many queries do you think are on this page, right? And I'd be told, you know, we have a lot of data, five, 10 queries, we're pulling in a lot of rows, but we're not like calling them that often, so it's not a big deal, right? Uh, and I was in an office maybe uh, 3,000 feet from here tops um, when I had this conversation. And it ended up being that they had 120 queries on the page because somebody called a method that they didn't realize was actually doing database queries instead of a nested for loop. Um, because people don't realize where data is coming from. They assume it must already just be an object in memory somewhere or, you know, clearly this is cached somewhere, right? It wasn't. They, were, they had 120 queries on, on, a, on an average page because they had these nested for loops that were just calling for, for, for data. Another one is um, also not far from here. Uh, we asked them, okay, so how many, how many megs do you think your sessions are, right? I mean, how, how big are your sessions? And they're like, we don't use sessions. They just store login credentials just for authentication. I'm like, okay, cool, no problem. But then we found that they're actually using 45 meg sessions. They had 45 megs in a session because they were actually inadvertently injecting the entire Drool's runtime into a session. Uh, and they, they hadn't had a problem yet because this app hadn't gone live yet and it was still in QA, but in QA they only had three users. And so that's okay, fine, I have 120 megs uh, in session data, but no one actually looks at that because the app works. So no one ever does a, a uh, post-mortem on the QA to see what actually happened performance-wise, right? But we, we hook up XRevel and, and then in three seconds, the guy's beat red and embarrassed about the fact that like he didn't realize that somebody on his team injected the entire tools runtime session scoped um, in his application. So what XRevel wants to do, it tries to do, like it doesn't do anything new, right? If you sit down and you have J Profiler or an APM and you have a dedicated performance person, they can spend the time and the cycles and figure the stuff out, okay? But who has time or resources to have that guy on, on, or girl on their team not writing code? If they're that good at the JVM stuff in the first place, they should be writing the stuff that you need them to write. So what we do with Xrevel is we kind of show you that we tell you where things are going wrong because they're going really wrong. So this is this is the stock spring pet clinic app. I've done nothing to make this more inefficient. This is what everyone who's learning how to use Spring uses as, as their template for how to write Spring code, right? And we see here that there's only like 10 rows on the screen. There's 10 rows of very basic data that should only be coming from one table. Uh, why, or maybe two tops? Why do we have why do we have 237 milliseconds of queries to run? And why were there 37 queries in the first place? Well. With actual, we can actually go and find out. So we warn you first off that this is crazy and this is too many queries. Um, we come with a, what we think are a pretty reasonable set of thresholds, and then you can actually modify the thresholds based on what is reasonable for your application. Um, and if you keep hitting the thresholds too often, we'll warn you, maybe change your thresholds, because you know, this isn't being effective anymore because you're seeing this, this message on, on every page, right? So if we click on this, um, this looks terrible because it's so zoomed in, but the idea is that we actually, this is the first time that a profiler for a developer actually lets them see in the browser the full request to the database. And so we can track 
that me calling pet get a get on pet clinic owners required 37 queries, and this is the total running time. Then we show you that we had one select that returned 10 rows. This is a very reasonable query. This query gave us these, these are the owners. That's all we actually want on this page, right? But then why do we run why do we run 26 more queries? Or 36 more queries? Well, we see that simple JDBC clinic dot load owners pets and visits is called. And that spawns 36 queries. And then we look and we see, okay, why are these 10 queries all grouped together? Because it's the exact same query with different parameters. This is a classic n plus one. And this is what Spring out of the box tells you to do with a Spring app, right? So what this means is that we can now take that latency from the database and multiply it by the number of times that we're calling against the database, right? So what, what, what this page should have no more than two queries or one, one join, right? Because you, you can write the owners and have it join against the pets, pull the pets in for the owners, and you're done. One query. If, if, but because we're using uh, JPA in this case, an unoptimized JPA, or an unoptimized JDBC, or an unoptimized Hibernate, we're just blindly pulling in everything, okay? And so we see that here that we ran these queries, okay? Then we did the same thing again. But these just got called, it just called, literally just calls the same query 10 times now, because it wants to know what types of pets they're on. That's not changing, right? And then it calls and gets every visit again as well for every pet. Right? So we can see here that these are all grouped together because they, they shouldn't be run anyways. And it helps you identify what you're doing. And we can tell what methods were called that actually made this happen. Then you can go into the queries view. And in the queries view, we actually show you like the full stack trace from JDBC in this case. But uh, every single query that was run, how many rows were returned, what duration, and everything. Okay? So this is super useful for that kind of thing. But now let's talk about sessions. Okay? It's not always obvious to you what's in your session. You, you may think you know, but you could very easily have some session scope that you shouldn't have. So let's say, for example, let's go pick, pick on Betty Davis. Okay, so let's go uh, add, um, add a visit. Okay, well, something just happened here. For some reason, we have 1.5 megs in our session. Okay, so our session grew. So first off, the delta is too large because we grew by way too much too fast which makes us think that you're writing some code that might you know, be erratic and just run off and grow and grow and grow. We also see that it's just too large in general. Like you, your high watermark in your session is too high. Right? This, is, this is limiting the number of users you have tremendously. Because if you have you know, a 12 meg session and you have 100 users, that's a lot of, that's a lot of data, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not sustainable. So let's just click on that. And what we see is that we actually can turn the uh, session into the object graph of the session. And so we can actually let you click in and see the data of what's inside your session. Okay, so this is this, is this owner, you see there's a server. Let me see the, the visit. We have a 1.6 meg visit. And then we go click in there and see that the pet actually has a cache. And this cache is 1.6 megs, right? Then if I go back and I want to say I want to go home, it's still there. So now we also know that we have a memory leak, right? Because now we have this, this visit object as a pet. In our, in, our, in our session, we're not using it anymore. It's not active on the screen. If we, if we ever go to that page, we're not going to be editing the same pet again, right? So now we have this, this 1.5 meg black hole per user for everyone who goes to that screen, right? So what we want to do is we want to show you that and make that, make that obvious to you so that you don't get a situation where you accidentally session scope a controller or something and pull in you know, 15 megs worth of spring libraries that don't belong into, into, your, into your, your session. The last one, I actually am going to modify the app a little bit because luckily Spring doesn't actually give you any any real runtime exceptions in the app. But uh, with Jarable, I can actually make some code changes that introduce an error without having to do, um, without having to uh, you know rebuild the app again. So I now have a runtime exception in my validator, and I can now go and add an owner. See, it's still telling me that my session's too large. If I, if I keep doing this, it's going to warn me that like. Okay, your session's still too large. Maybe you should, you know, configure your threshold because we're still warning you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So this little sprocket here, packages, thresholds, right there. So you can change whether you care about certain things or not. You can also change the numbers. So uh, if you don't care about sessions as long as they're under a meg, make that make that your threshold. 
by default, we ship with 500, 200, 10, and 100. Uh, you think that 500K for a session is pretty reasonable. You know, if you're actually doing session-based work, that, that, that's okay. Um, if, but if, you're, if your session is increasing by over 200K per request, then we, we'll, we'll warn you about that. Um, if the number of queries ex executed is more than 10 per request, we'll warn you about that as well. Um, these are just things that, that we think are reasonable, but you know, obviously your app's different than ours, so don't change them, right? Um, so now, when I try to validate, now we get an exception, because I have that new runtime exception. So normally, um, Java devs might not even know the exception happened, because the app didn't crash, right? We had a, a new runtime exception, it's not being handled, but no one really cares, because the app's still gone. If I actually click on this, what we do is we actually invert the stack trace, so you can see where your, your exception is actually coming from. So you're not stuck trying to find, oh, well, I have this null pointer, but I don't really know what's happening because this is like 15 layers deep in the framework. What we have is owner validator validate on line 20 through the, the, this exception. So now I can go back to my to my IDE and say, okay, <coughs> line 20, ah, here's my exception. Got it. I, I understand what I'm doing now. Okay? And this is really important because I know that anyone here who writes actual applications that are used by real companies probably have tons of layers of stuff between your, your presentation layer and where exceptions could happen. You need to try to figure out where they are. Uh, if we can tell you in a very quick, reasonable fashion exactly what line you were through the exception, then you have a much better chance of figuring out what actually went wrong in your application. So for example, this case study that went live today, they thought it was happening in one other place because part of their exception handling was just catching it and throwing it back and saying this is what happened. But that wasn't what was happening. It wasn't that it was actually at the, the processing layer in, in, in the merge config. Um, so that's really like uh, X Rebel and JRebel got together in mind, helping you write better code faster, right? So it's all about making your job easier and your, your, your deliverables higher quality. Um, and with that, back to my keynote, I actually made uh, this meme like two years ago for the sales team at my company. Like based on pics taken, right? Like um, they all loved it, so I sent this once in a while. Um, so that's everything I've got for you. But there are two links here. I tried to use a, little, a shortener. We have our own little shortener, zero t dot bb. Um, so the important things are jr dot bjm and xr dot bjm, and those give you uh, fourteen day trials on both of our products. And I'm sure that Burke is awesome and would somehow let me email those to you if you are speed yes, should actually came up or something. Um, yeah, that, that, that's worth it. Um, that's what I got. Any questions? Yeah. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you.